My name is Leslie Wilcox. I'm a professor uh, in the Department of Management and I'm director of the Outsourcing Unit and in the Information Systems and Innovation Group. I suspect I've been asked to chair this session because of my abiding interest in outsourcing, which goes back to 1991. And um, also because I co-authored uh, the first academic paper on offshore outsourcing between India and the USA. More of that later. Um, I want to give a bit of context to this theme very shortly and then introduce our speaker and then invite him to, to speak for uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, context is this, that the outsourcing market uh, was about $10 billion revenues in 1989 and in the end of 2010 on our figures we reckon that the IT outsourcing market will be about uh, $270 billion dollars. The business process outsourcing market, which you are also in, um, will be about 160, 170 billion US dollars. Of those combined figures, 60 billion of revenues in 2010 will be from offshore outsourcing. Uh, India will account for 65% of the IT outsourcing of offshore and 50% of the BPO. And Infosys will be in, continue to be in the top two Indian suppliers within those figures. That's where we, we are today. All the extrapolations forward is that the outsourcing market will continue to grow. The IT outsourcing market probably at a rate globally of 5 to 8 percent per annum. The BPO market, if I think your hope's right on this, uh, between uh, 8 and 12 percent the offshore market faster than that. That's basically a consensus of predictions into the future. Um, let me introduce our speaker um, because I don't want him to spend time telling you about his career. I'll give you the short version. Um, S.T. Shibalal uh, is at present Chief Operating Officer for Infosys and a Board Director. He was in fact one of the seven founding members of Infosys Technologies Limited back in 1981, which must have been a very insightful and prescient thing to do at that time. Worked for them for 10 years. He took what he calls a sabbatical at Sun Microsystems for five years. It's some sabbatical. He was setting up their internet um, development centers and delivery. Uh, that's right at the front of uh, internet developments. He then has only worked for Infosys subsequently uh, in various capacities. Um, he's been Internet Consultancy Services Head, Worldwide Head of Customer Delivery, Group Head, Worldwide Sa Sales and Customer Delivery. Took up his present position in 2007 as Chief Operating Officer. So vast experience, uh, vast experience in the IT field, in the business world, right at the hub of globalization. He's going to talk about the future of IT in India. He's going to talk for about 20 minutes. I'm going to have a discussion with him. I have some provocative questions to ask him myself for 20 minutes, and then we'll throw it open to you for further questions for about 20, 25 minutes. So without further ado, can I invite you to address us? Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's, uh, pleasure for me to be here. So I represent uh, Infosys. We are about $5 billion in revenue, close to that, about 120,000 people. And I am definitely one of the privileged ones who had the chance to be part of that journey for the last 30 years. So after the first 15 years, I did take a break I took a sabbatical and worked for uh, Sun Microsystems. It was indeed the golden era for Sun, when not because I was there, but I happened to be, <laughs> happened to be there. And uh, I took a lot of knowledge back to Enforces after that sabbatical. It came in very handy for me as well as for the organization over the last 15 years. Now, to talk about the future of IT, actually I felt that we should see the context. 
where it started and where it is today. So it is a very interesting journey over the last 30 years. I have looked at it in many different ways, using different viewpoints or different ways of looking at the history of this industry. And I will briefly take you the, through that. I will briefly take you through the industry history as well as where we are and then talk about the future that also very briefly. See these are some of the key events which created this industry. See when Infosys was founded in 1981 it was a completely different India. It was an India of constraints. It was about license raj, capital market controls, Foreign Exchange Regulations Act. So every single constraint you can name, we had it. It took us two years to get a telephone, one year to get a car. So that was the world before the early 90s. Before the economic liberalization which happened in 90s. At the same time, during that period, some good things had happened. English was the language which was very prevalent in our education system. The IIT started in 1951. Just imagine a country which just got independence had the vision to start these, these institutions which produce world class talent. I mean, went out of India in 1977 and that opened the door for many new organizations, new corporations to enter India. Digital Equipment Corporation, Data General, Honeywell, all these companies came into India and started selling their software and hardware. So that for the first time opened the country to new technologies. And the companies like Infosys, TCS, Wipro, they started somewhere in the early 80s. The growth in the beginning was minuscule at best. We couldn't import a computer. We needed to guarantee export revenue to import a computer. In 1990, early 1990, the economic liberalization happened because of, of course, various factors. STPIs were set up, that is the software technology parks were established in the early 90s. Luckily, all of us, I should say the whole industry, which predominantly today consists of maybe four to five big players, were ready and prepared to take advantage of that liberalization, that new world. So in many ways, when we do our corporate presentation, we say that we are a child of modern India. We are indeed a child of the liberalization. License Raj was abolished, capital markets were freed, the Foreign Exchange Regulation Acts were removed, and we were ready and willing to move ahead. And of course, followed by that, you had the Telecom um, Reforms Act. Today, India has close to 500 million cell phones. Imagine, this is a country where I could not get a landline for two years. At the same time, we only, had, we only have 70 million broadband users. That is because the last mile is still a problem for us. So these are some of the key events which created this industry. Now if you look at the industry per se and look at it from a value chain perspective, in the backdrop of those events I talked about, in the 70s we started out by exporting programmers, basically people. And that also people who came out of the IIT. That was the first set of people whom we sent abroad. These were some of the most 
brilliant people the country produced. Early 90s or, or in the mid 90s, we figured out that sending so many people abroad is not a viable option. The same set of challenges which are there even today about visas and people traveling. So we felt that if we can change the paradigm, what is the paradigm? The paradigm is to send the worker to the work. The work is in US, we will send an employee. So you, it is about sending the worker, taking the worker to the work. And we felt that if we can change the paradigm and take the work to the worker, instead of moving the worker, it will be a big shift. And that is what we basically did in the mid 80s. We created this platform or process called Global Delivery Model. Where fundamentally we shifted the original model of taking worker to work and started taking work to where the worker is. So we started out with offshore programming later on graduated into project management that happened late 80s, early 90s and that happened because of two or three reasons one, it is a normal value chain um, aspiration or moving up the value chain second, most of these corporations started looking at world class standards so we adapted the ISO 9000 model, the CMM level 4 and level 5. We learned from the Malcolm Baldrige framework. We started applying for these, uh, not applying, preparing for these certifications, these global standards. And through that process, improved our management capabilities. Now one thing, India did have management depth even in 90s and 80s. So we could easily build it over a period of time. Then came the Y2K event, late 90s. Corporations had ton of work to do, ton of work, and they had no manpower. So they came to India for getting the Y2K work done, thinking that they will get it done and never come back. What happened during that period was while we did the Y2K work, we learned about their business. We created a knowledge base. We created people who understand their technology and business. By the end of it, it was a very compelling reason for these clients to continue working with us. Because there was so much of knowledge which was accumulated, so much of experience, which was created that they had to work with us and in any case the model which we adapted was a relationship based model so that went on to build those relationships then of course the internet bubble came along so that gave us more opportunities if you see the value chain Today we are in, in a completely different place. We are starting out a new journey in IT and ITS services today, in 2010. Most organizations today span the entire spectrum of services in the IT world. Many of them have the consulting capabilities, they have the domain skills, program management capabilities, project management capabilities, infrastructure management. So most of the corporations, including ours, have built an end-to-end service capability over the last 15 years. And today we are moving towards enabling our clients to leverage the next wave of global trends. That also means that our local knowledge, in fact if you look at the future, 
Or the challenge for us is to increase our local presence and local knowledge. So if you look at the recruitment plans of most of these offshore system integrators, there is more and more local recruitment. Recruiting in US, in Europe, more and more domain expertise being built. The future in a nutshell, I think the numbers are already talked about. There are two parts I see to this industry. One is the domestic piece and second is the global part. Today the domestic market is considerably small. By 2020 the domestic market is expected to reach 50 billion dollars and a number of reasons. India is a country of contradictions, remember. You have 8.5% GDP growth and 300 million below the poverty line. You are producing 700,000 engineers and 140 million children are not in, not in proper schools. So it is a world of contradictions. And technology is one of the ways by which you can improve the quality of life. So there is going to be a lot of investment. Government is committed to making tremendous amount of investments into e-governance, into healthcare, into education using technology. So the domestic market is expected to reach $50 billion by 2010. Of course, the global sourcing market is also um, you know, growing at a healthy pace. Now for us, uh, our revenue is predominantly from the IT services side. It is not from the BPO side at this point in time. This is a brief history of our journey. We started out in 81, billion dollars in 2004 and um, 2 billion dollars in 2006. It took us 20, I don't know, 22 years to reach a billion dollars and two years to add another billion. It also reflects uh, the environment. It is not only about us. It has a lot to do with the environment, the India brand and various other things. You can see that we have continuously tried to go up the value chain. Now, in my mind, it is not about going up the value chain, it is about expanding the value chain. In 99, 95% of our revenue used to come from application development and maintenance. Today it is 46%. 24% of our revenue today comes from consulting and enterprise solutions work. So that shows that we have been able to build that end-to-end -end capability and go up the value chain over the last 12 to 13 years. This is our vision and you know, this in a nutshell is all about us. It defines us, this one single slide defines who we are. Our vision is to be a globally respected corporation, providing best of breed business solutions and leveraging technology. So today in our mind, technology is a means and not an end. The business goals are the end. The client's business goals or business objectives are the end and we use technology to enable them to reach those goals. The central part is also very important. We believe that we should have an organization which is predictable, which means that we can commit to the market how we will perform and meet that, those commitments which is sustainable. Profitability is very important for us because that allows us to invest for the future, invest on our employees, on, our, on the infrastructure, and invest for building capabilities. We de-risk the organization in multiple ways. The value systems have been there and consistent over the last 30 years. We believe that we should be fair and transparent with all the stakeholders, customers, investors, employees, and society at large. 
these are uh, some of our aspirations and this also reflects our um, our interest or our aspiration in moving up the value chain so if you look at it we want to get 33 percent of our revenue from consulting and consulting related work our revenue today is 63 percent from us we would like to reduce that dependency while we continue to grow and increase our revenue from Europe. So now there are a lot of investments which are happening in Europe and <coughs> in the rest of the world. Industry leading financial performance is very important to us. We look at growth, profitability and return on investment. This is the last slide. This is our strategy map. It's a very internal document. We actually show it to everyone. It is our strategy map. And this defines our investments and how it connects with clients. Um, how does it connect with being relevant to the clients? Now, when I look at the industry, um, there are multiple challenges. One, while we produce 700,000 engineers, all of them are not ready for the multinational work. I would consider only about 30 to 35 percent. The capacity of education system has gone up considerably over the last many years. It has gone up from 400, sorry, probably 450,000 to 550,000 over the last five years. But the quality needs to improve, that is number one. Number two would be the infrastructure in India. Infrastructure in India deserves a lot of attention, a lot of improvement. And it's happening, but at a very slow pace. So the first one is with education, second is with infrastructure. And the third one is a bigger issue. As I, write, as I said in the beginning, we are a country of contradictions. And those contradictions show up very uh, visibly when you look at the growth. A the country is growing at 8.5% and, and you have 300 million people below the poverty line. You know, the philosophy of trickle-down economics takes a while. The challenge is to make sure that you maintain the social order and don't and make sure that also the demography of India is very unique at this point. Huge amount of young population. I think some 65 percent of the people below 35 years old, some very, very high number. Which means if you cannot provide employment to these youngsters, you are going to lead you are going to get into social um, social unrest. So that is a challenge for the country. I don't see market as a challenge. I don't see competition as a challenge. I hear China is coming up, Philippines. Yes, in my mind competition is good. It, it forces us to be on our toes. The challenges are somewhat internal in my mind at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shibu. Um, some questions I'm going to ask, uh, I'll organize them into three areas. <clears throat> First are financial, the second um, labor issues, and the third technology futures. <clears throat> Um, I found it very interesting reading your annual report. I, I should explain I'm a qualified accountant in another life. And I, the, my first hold on any corporation is the financials. And uh, I think uh, your audience just did a good, good job saying you're showing a true and fair view, by the way. Um, but there's some startling things that jump out at me in a reading of that. Um, the first one is you, you've got a, a revenue this year of 4.8 billion. US dollars, and you have a, a net profit after income of 1.313 billion. Now, I'm used to the outsourcing industry where margins 
can be as low as 1% and can get as high as 9 to 12%. And if we compare you to Accenture, which I know you, you sort of lust after being to some extent, but hopefully not entirely, Accenture's revenue is 22 billion this year, probably, and their profit is 3 billion. So on a, a, a revenue four times your size, they're only doubling the profit. What's the secret? <laughs> <laughs> so, <coughs> so actually, the, um, let me just, the Accenture's um, profit margin is about 14%, if I'm right. Approximately 12 to 14%. See, I think um, one needs to look at it in multiple ways. If you look at the industry average revenue productivity, that is a revenue per person, it's about 140, 125 to 150 thousand dollars per per year. Ours is 75,000. So it's important. We are not the profit is not coming from charging the client. The per person revenue productivity of Infosys is half of the industry average. So in that sense, we are in a golden spot because we can only go up because the umbrella is up there. <coughs> So the profit is coming from the model in which we operate. If you look at the industry, outsourcing industry, and specifically some of the global SIs, for example, the marketing cost would be about 15 to 20 percent. Ours is 7 percent. Because we believe in a relationship-based model. We believe in few clients. So we have a total of about 600 clients at this point, predominantly Fortune 2000, and we believe in a model by which we invest in the relationship and continue to do business with them. So we are able to control our marketing expenses. Number one. Number two, we eat the dog food. It's a very important statement. We talk about global delivery model, which means that we tell our clients, look, we are able to do this work. You please give us this piece of work. We will do it in any part of the world and give it back to you. You will not know where it is done but you will not feel the pain. That is a, that's an important point to make. We, you will not feel the pain. We do the same thing. I have three people sitting there from office. If they have to book a ticket, it is booked out of the, one of the locations where the expenses are the lowest. It could be <laughs> India or in Philippines. But the point is, we have globalized all our processes in such a way that we do it where the talent is available and it is cheapest to do. So that gives us, so our SGNA expenses are probably 60% of the industry average. And the third point, I actually can go on, but the third point is the utilization of banks. How do you, one of the important cost elements, 56% of our revenue is, um, is salary cost, salary expenses. Now, any optimization you can do in that, that space, 56%, is, um, is worth it. So, how do you manage your unutilized part of your manpower? It becomes a very important piece. Our utilization outside US is maybe 94%, and in India, it is lower, where the cost is lower. <coughs> so, the model in which we operate contributes heavily towards our margin. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> the second one is about where your revenues come from. 97, 98.7% of your revenues are from overseas, typical of an Indian outsourcing company. And 1.3% come from your domestic revenues. Is this going to change or is there a logic to why that should continue? Actually, uh, number one, it is going to change. Number two, there is a historical reason why this is the way it is. When it started out, the domestic market in India was not mature. And the IT spend was very, very low when we started out. So we focused on where the market is available. And see, the way we, we decide to attack the market where the demand is highest and get the talent where it is most available and scalable. So it made sense at that point in time to, um, to look at the world market. We have a uh, focus on India right now. We have um, 
and we have had very good winds recently. But please remember, it will the percentage will continue to be small because you know the, it's on a big base, and the growth is happening all around. In fact, more importantly, the European percentage will shift faster. If you look at the aspirations which I showed, yeah. our aspiration is to grow Europe rather than, you know, <coughs> not rather than India, but, you know, our, our aspiration is to grow Europe. Because right now the US gives us about 64% of our revenue and we would like to um, see it between 40 to 50% at some point in our future. So we are investing into Europe. We have recruited um, country heads for France and Germany. UK has been always a good market for us. France and Germany, continental Europe. And we are recruiting local talent in, in Europe and in the UK. Okay. Um, labour issues. <coughs> it's quite a, you mentioned a country of, of paradoxes and contradictions. Um, there are some here. You have 113,800 employees, I think, in the last reading I, I did of it. Um, you have no shortage of highly qualified applicants. You're like London, London School of Economics in that, in that respect. Um, and yet, in 2009, the Indian Commission on IT reports real concerns in India over lack of skilled workers to sustain growth and particularly in the area of middle managers, which is one of my interests because I've just got a paper coming out where I've researched uh, the, uh, the crucial role of middle management in outsourcing in these uh, offshore locations, India being one of them. And it seems that all of them are reporting shortages of, of middle management. At the same time, uh, of course, uh, most of your workers uh, are, are, I think you describe it in your annual report as technical professionals. I think the vast majority are, I can't remember the, the figures, but uh, it, it, it's a uh, very high, high percentage, over 90%. And yet your aspirations are to move up the value chain to business consultancy, re-engineering, business process operations, business model innovation. So the question is, how are you going to get there? So um, I think um, First of all, I think there, are, there is drastic difference between when you look at the industry and us, per se. Right. Because we are, as you rightly said, number two uh, in the industry. And from a brand perspective and the employee attraction perspective, probably number one or number two. So the challenges which we face are very different from some of the mid-tier or the other organizations will face, number one. Number two, we, we produce about 700, 600,000 engineers every year. As I said, about 25% of those people are ready for employment, multinational ready, what I call multinational ready. The remaining needs training and enablement to come into the industry. So it is not even for us, the challenge is, so there are three categories of people in the organization. The entry level people whom we get from the colleges, the middle management and the leadership. These are the three segments. So if you look at the entry level people, we have no problem attracting the best. We really do not have. We um, go to the campuses, we can conduct tests and we can recruit today. Any, uh, and, and other than the, the first one person who, who comes here for studies, who wants to come to LSE, the rest will join us. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, but at the same time, we really need to enable them. Even the, some of them, even the best need some amount of enablement. So we have a training facility in Mysore where we can train 14,000 people residential. So if we do um, four batches a year, you are talking about 60,000 people to be trained in one single facility. Probably the world's largest training facility of that kind is, is, is what we have. We also have a middle management institute and we call it middle management development program. See in Infosys, the learning is the lifelong issue. You, you come into organization, you go into a class, before you leave also you will be in a class. So that is a way of life at Infosys because you have the middle management institution, a middle management development program which is meant for the middle managers and we start probably at the second or third year of their, after they join our organization to train them on management uh, related issues. 
And finally, we have a leadership institute which looks after people after about 12 years, 12 to 30 years. They go into the leadership institute. We, after saying all this, the, the lack, so there is no dearth of talent at the fresher level, but there is dearth of talent, there is lack of talent in the middle management as an industry phenomenon. And the solution has been to enable them. So when you say you have, you know, actually the number now is 120,000 people, but I can guarantee you that if, uh, if you look at our employment number, we should be close to 200,000 people. Because we have contributed 80,000 people towards the industry. So the larger organizations are investing in creating middle management. We also have the Institute of Management. We have about five or six uh, Indian Institute of Management, which are extremely well reputed. Now talking of consulting and our aspiration, I think you know also remember our revenue profile today is very very different. 24 or 25 percent of our revenue today comes from consulting, system integration and high-end package implementation kind of work, 24 percent. So we have enough talent. The application development and maintenance work which used to be our bread and butter work before 2000 is today only about 42 percent. 42 or 43 percent. So we have already gone past a lot of these numbers as our organization. When you look at the industry, uh, there is this challenge. And I want to add one more point. Today our focus is to recruit outside. It's very important to remember. We are recruiting 1,000 people of, of, um, of <coughs> domain consultants, 1,000 domain consultants in US as we speak. We are recruiting in Germany and France. We are recruiting in UK. That is a challenge for us because our brand recognition outside India is in no way same as what is in India. For the employees, for the clients it's a different issue but for the target employees. So we are working on it and our challenge today is not India. For Infosys, our challenge today is not India, it is actually outside. And to, to move into that orbit, of becoming uh, a 100% true business partner for our clients. We need to have uh, at least 15% of our talent recruited locally outside India. All right, thank you. My last question before I throw it open is about technology futures. Uh, there was a provocative article in Business Week, August 2010, which I mentioned to you before we came on the stage which is uh, by two management consultants who is headed the end of outsourcing as we know it. And basically it says over the next five years, outsourcing as we know it will disappear. Um, the legion of Indian suppliers will be sidelined or absorbed. US and European companies that pioneered this corner of the high-tech industry will suffer similar fates if they don't wake up. The new leaders will be Google and Amazon as they turn to outsourcing services. Um, and losers are in particular mid-tier Indian outsourcers, according to this, too small uh, but attractive to be acquired. And um, emphasis in Wipro, risk losing competitive advantage. And the nightmare is meant to be cloud computing for you. Um, so, um, I have to write a rebuttal to this paper, so I'd be welcome your insights. <laughs> so, um, number one, actually, uh, on the lighter side, I must have answered this question at every junction. <laughs> <laughs> right, because when the mainframe disappeared and the minis came around, when the PCs came around, then the uh, internet came around, right, every junction, every one of those uh, turns, in the technology, the same question has come up. And all what has happened over the last 30 years is that the environment has become more and more complex. It has continued to be a hybrid environment. There are enough mainframes out there even today. Most of the heavy lifting is still done by the mainframes because we work with those clients. COBOL was supposed to be wiped out. It's still there. I wrote those programs in in uh, early 80s and I, I'm sure some of them are still running. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, technology 
you know, um, the environment, unfortunately, and I don't think it's a good thing, huh, what I'm talking about, because it has become way too complex and hybrid. So I don't consider it as a good thing, but that is what eventually tend to happen. Cloud is a phenomenal thing. I'm sure um, there will be, we are seeing tremendous interest from cloud, uh, from our clients, I'm sorry, from our clients about cloud. Many of them are moving towards private cloud. Public cloud is a, is a um, difficult thing because we are working with some of the, you know, we are working with the Fortune 500 and they, come, they have your data. Your social security numbers and your credit card numbers are with them. And you know, I don't know how um, comfortable they will feel about putting those into the public cloud. My belief is that it will coexist. There will be fundamental shift. There is no doubt. There is no doubt. And the way we provide services will have to change. And the players will change. So Google and Amazon will take a, you know, may take a prominent role or somebody else will take a prominent role because Microsoft now says that they are a cloud company. So they might take a prominent role. We, the services, some of the services which we provide today directly to a client may have to be provided to someone else. So the players will change, but the service industry and, and, and uh, um, the work which we do will, will have to be modified, but I really don't believe it will go away. Um, and also please remember, we are building business solutions. We are not building technology solutions. We are building tech supply chain management. It doesn't matter whether you build it on mainframe or on cloud, it is still supply chain management. We are building risk management solution for um, global players. It doesn't matter where you run it. We are building, we are implementing HR, HR systems. It doesn't matter where you run it. So, we are in the business of building <coughs> business solutions. And if you look at it, in the top of this chart, we believe that these are the global trends on which we are building these solutions. It's about digital consumer, sustainability, pervasive computing, sensor networks, uh, smart organization. <coughs> These are the themes to which we build solutions and products. We will use cloud, we will use mainframe, we will use uh, minis, we will use client server. But at the end of the day, we are building business solutions. So let's not get blinded by the technology as a constant theme in, in your answers. Uh over the years. Right, we can throw it open now. Uh, I think there are microphones all around, so if you raise your hand, um, there's one back here, and I'll just point if I may. I'm sorry if it feels rude, but it's the easiest way. Hi, thank you so much for your insight into India's success story and uh, Infosys' role in that. My question is that uh, I know India has come up a long way using IT. Do you think this is going to proliferate to other neighboring countries like Bangladesh or Pakistan? Do you think they can follow the Indian model and come up with, like, improve their economy in the same way as India has done? So I think it is very important to have political will. All said and done, I have talked about it. This is a result of <coughs> political will. There, was, there were key events which happened, which changed the environment, which created this industry. Right? And not only all this industry, all the growth in India. Right? So <coughs> it is very important for the, these countries to have the political will to do it. China is a classic example. I go to China and they have done a fabulous job, a fabulous work. They are producing 600,000 engineers. They are, they, are, you know, uh, they, they, they are much more aggressive in, in building capabilities. Um, they have a very extremely active government. So for example, we have a development center in China and we have gotten excellent support from the government. As much as you know, there are always some rough edges, but there is tremendous amount of political will and it is clearly visible in China <coughs> what you can achieve with that kind of political will. Philippines, I have seen, we have a center in Philippines doing extremely well. So I think it's very important to have the leadership of the country um, committed to progress. And then you can emulate any model, right? Whether it is the India model or the China model or some other model or, or a combination of both. Thank you. Uh, this gentleman here, Dr. 
Um, how do you see the trend going between, on the one hand, outsourcing as you describe it, and on the other, large companies setting up their own offshore IT and related uh, you know, departments in India and elsewhere? So I think these have coexisted for a very long time. If you, if you look at one of my slides, I talk about Texas Instruments, which came to India in 1977, if I'm right, so many years back. Um, there are many other companies like Cisco, Microsoft, everybody has uh, their senders. Um, in a way, it is very good because it enlarges the talent pool. It enlarges the ecosystem. It allows um, cross fertilization of knowledge and, uh, and even in some sense early um, knowledge getting passed around, so it's very good. Um, the challenge they face is slightly different. Please remember, we grow, we, you know, we, are a, we are in the business of software. That is what we are, right? We are in the business of software. Um, many of the captives, the captives which are set up are not, the mothership is not really in the business of software. So for us, when we grow 20%, we are adding 20% talent, people to the software side. Which means that there is, there is constant career advancement, there is constant growth for people at Infosys. Right? Because when the company is growing by 20%, there are 20% more program managers and project managers and what not. So the growth is extremely um, high for the people who are with the pure play IT service providers. In the captives, that is not true. Because they have a limited amount of growth which they can do and the people tend to stagnate. Number one. Number two, we are, at the end of the day, we are a vendor. Please remember, we provide a service to a client. So we have tremendous need to drive productivity and quality. Captives may not have that. And so there are so on one side, you know, it is good for the industry. I clearly believe competition is good. It creates um, uh, an urge to improve, need to improve, and the ecosystem gets larger. Um, there are challenges. Some captives do very well. Some are faced with these challenges. This one over here. Hi, my question is recently on the US, where they have increased the immigration fees by four folds. They have been banned from certain states on outsourcing. How do you think Infosys, a company like Infosys, is going to tackle or going to challenge or cope up with this ongoing blacklash on practicism in, in US, especially? So, um, you know, I think the fundamental question is about globalization. You know, if you look at the last 20 years, the quality of life around the world has come up only because of one reason and that is truly because of globalization. Whether it is manufacturing globalization, whether it is service globalization. So I clearly believe that that trend will continue. Number one. Number two, US, I have lived there for so many years. So uh, it's almost like my own, um, you know, um, place. And, you know, while they, they, there's a lot of debate and a lot of... Um, some of action are taken, there is always uh, common sense which usually prevails in the long run, number two. Number three, on the H1 visa friend, the cost increase is very, mar you know, it's, it's big, but it is for us it is marginal. Please remember, we have six, five billion dollar corporation and the four or five million dollars really is not going to bring us down. On the Ohio ruling, it is a government ruling. We ourselves are going into government business. We have no government business at this point in time, zero. We have just recently set up a subsidiary to do government business in US and that is a US subsidiary. So it will have no operations in India. We will only recruit people in US and we will, so we will be fully compliant uh, in that way. Um, the, the, you know, the backlash and also in the US, the fourth point is that while the government, government rarely gets involved in, in, um, in driving corporations in a, in a certain direction. So most um, corporations do take decisions which are, which are best for them. Thank you very much for your insightful presentation. 
My question is like a follow-up to the gentleman's um, question. In your presentation, you talked about trying to recruit from local, um, locally from countries like Europe. You're trying to expand to those countries. And you earlier on mentioned that one of your USPs or unique selling points is that you are able to minimize costs, you know. So if you are going to be um, recruiting from, you know, these countries, it means they are going to be um, the cost of, um, you know, hiring and, you know, sustaining this employer, empl employees, I mean, will be higher. So how sustainable is your performance, financial performance based on this? What, what, what are you looking at towards um, maintaining this financial performance? Actually, recruiting locally is cheaper for us. It's a very surprising fact, but it is because, first of all, we pay market salary for all the employees of ours who are here, even today. In some countries, we pay above the market salary because when you would send people from India to those countries, there are minimum salary compensation levels which we need to keep, which in general are higher than the local compensation. So when I send somebody from India to uh, another country, uh, in many situations, in fact, some of our very large markets, the minimum compensation we need to pay is higher than the average local compensation. So the cost of having people there or being sent out of India is, is same. And we do not distinguish between local employees and our employees traveling because that would be a completely unfair thing to do because you would be paying two different compensation for the same kind of work and it is not sustainable. It can sustain for a while but it is not sustainable in the long run. So, um, and please remember in the global delivery model 30% or actually right now 28% of our work is done on site which is in the local locations. When we recruit people, we are all we are doing is to uh, progressively reduce the number of people who come from India. It is not like the numbers are going to change that much because we are also growing. So um, financially, the, the real problem is slightly different. The real problem is the utilization which we keep up on site will marginally come down. So we need to make sure that that is balanced. That is the issue. There's a, there's a question here. Um, for many years, I think there was the view that uh, Japan didn't innovate but copied um, and its growth rested on, on essentially being a copycat and a cheap copycat and then quality took over. I think uh, you mentioned CMM and ISO and, and India, I think there's probably still a view that uh, we provide smart people who speak English and essentially that's how we're competing in service deliverably in, 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 in service delivery. I'm looking at uh, behind uh, the professor's head there's a, a box labeled research and innovation and thinking how tied in with your desire to change the brand perception, tied in with your views to move up the value chain, where does intellectual property research and innovation fit in and could you give us a view of you know, 20 years how, how that will change Infosys and, and the view of Infosys in, in the world. Right, so, uh, you know, innovation is nothing new for Infosys. Um, if you look at, um, and, um, but please remember, we are a service, we predominantly are a service organization so far. Uh, the only product we have out in the market in a very large scale, I, I mean large scale is Finnecker, which is our banking product, which gives us 5% of our revenue. And the intellectual property is fully owned by us. The research and development center was set up in 1997, so 13 years back. For years, we never filed a patent because we never felt that, because most of our innovations over the last first 20 years was predominantly in the process space. So the innovation for global delivery model, the innovation for modular global sourcing, these are innovations in the process space and we really never bothered to file any patent. In the last two years, we have taken an active role in filing patents and we have filed about 220 patents. We have been awarded some of the patents. So I see intellectual property playing a very big role in our life going forward. Our revenue from um, products today is about 5%, 5, 5.5%. If you look at my slide, the previous slide, <coughs> the, the 33, 33, 33 number, 33% of our revenue is supposed to come from products, platforms, solutions, and new models of engagement, where there is a serious content, a serious amount of intellectual property involved. 
So um, we are investing into identifying. It's not about creating intellectual property. It is about identifying and filing patents or a lot more intellectual property as than before. And before I uh, conclude, uh, there has been a number of products which we have taken to market now. There's a product for light transform for the healthcare industry which is in the market. <coughs> there is a product called um, Shopping Trip 360. Shopping Trip 360 for the retail market, retail industry in the market. We have um, another platform called um, I Engage which is in the market. Some of them are 100% owned by us, some of them are 50% uh, intellectual property owned by us. Right, we're going to have about five minutes more, so uh, there's time for about three questions, and that's one of them there. Uh, good evening, and thank you. Uh, you mentioned just a few minutes ago that uh, the most important thing for countries uh, would be to have political, kind of political support if they want to emulate any kind of model. And I was just wondering if you could talk a, a little bit about what kind of uh, political support you had from the Indian government. Thank you. I think they have an excellent public support from the Indian government. I, I don't mean, see, please remember, the question was about emulating some of the models, and that's why I said political will and leadership. I think the government has given um, very good support for the industry, if you look at it. Um, you know, the setting up of AC sets, sorry, not ACs, um, uh, SEEPs, it's called, uh, something was set up in as early as 79 or so um, in Bombay followed by the STPIs, Software Technology Parks, uh, which was set up in late 80s or early 90s. And recently they have set up ACE sets, uh, which are special economic zones. Again, uh, tax breaks were given to the industry. So, um, the, so there has been very good support. You know, um, it's always, uh, whether you look at the, ha the cup, which is <coughs> half full or half empty, there are always, uh, you know, you, the government is now working on airports and roads and uh, single window clearances and various things. So it is a journey, uh, but I think the industry has, uh, has been blessed with uh, support from the government. Uh, one at the back there. Hello. When UK companies first started to outsource IT operations to India, it seemed that it was mainly the back office work that was being sent out to India. Has that focus now shifted and what would you say is the split between back office and front office work being done in India? Yeah, so I think uh, um, the focus has now shifted and um, uh, there is, um, I am not referring to the business process side because our business process side all said and done is about $320 million out of the $5 million. $5 billion. Um, on the IT side, I think um, today we are all over, the, you know, all around. We do front office work, so we do, um, we build uh, customer service systems, we build trading systems, we build risk management systems, we build, um, um, you know, when the, the last round of m and the mergers and acquisitions which happened, we had a fair share of work which we did to merge systems and build uh, the new platforms. We are in actively involved in, in products, um, some of the very innovative products which came out recently from the Silicon Valley, we had worked on front as well as on the back. So um, I think we do uh, all around work. I don't know the breakup. I, it's, it's, I don't know. Last question, I'm afraid. Some industry experts are forecasting that India will soon lose its advantage uh, as far as cost is concerned. How would you respond to those kind of forecasts? So, um, there are two ways to look at it. Number one, they're talking about the compensation increase. Now, the compensation in India has, has gone up um, year after year for the last many years. But one needs to actually feel the onion and look at the numbers. When we look, when we say the compensation goes up by 14 to 15 percent year after year, it is approximately 3 percent of the revenue uh, because the offshore component is 15. There is all kinds of maths which you can look at, and that also, if you look at it over the last six or seven years, the total cost 
uh, increase is only about 30 percent over the last six years because the the structure of the organizations this is a very industry phenomena the structure of the organization is a pyramid structure you are adding a lot of people to the bottom where the average compensation is lower so you have a pyramid where the average is let's say 700 dollars per person and you add some 20,000 people to the bottom, the average will fall to $550 or $500. So these, these dynamics have to be looked at. So on an average, uh, over the last six years, so, so the compensation has gone up by approximately 30%, 30-32%. At the same time, the productivity has gone up quite a lot. So it balances out. Now, um, that is uh, one way to look at it. Second is to look at the value which you provide. See, please remember, nothing is static. The value which we provide is not anywhere similar to what we provided six years back. The capability which we have today is not anywhere similar to what we had uh, six years back. So, this goes hand in hand. And lastly, please remember, compensation increase happens because of demand. If there is no demand, there is no compensation increase. So in 2009, when the demand was very bad, very poor, there was no compensation increase. So this is a cyclical thing. Right? When there is tremendous demand, there is shortage of manpower, the compensation goes up. If the demand subsides, the compensation will also start balancing off. So it's a, it's a cyclical thing. Okay, I'm going to have to stop it there. Um, he's, Shibu has dis described the long journey of emphasis. What you don't know is he himself has been on a very long journey today, <coughs> and traveling, and uh, has a very busy day tomorrow, so I'm going to have to protect you a bit here. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your questions, and by way of appreciation, I'd like to give you this copy of this book that uh, we've done out of the outsourcing unit. There is a point to this, which is that chapter five of this book, and I write this in the fly,